Welcome to Nomad Land Podcast once again. It's a privilege to be with you in your ears. Um, my name is Yaya. I have the wonderful airphone with me. And before I introduce the guests, I just want to acknowledge the day, the time that we're in currently. It is January 8th, right? Right. And um, as Iranian Americans, we're going through some interesting times. Um, it's definitely worth observing and feeling and going into and seeing how it affects us. So I just don't want to start off this episode without, without acknowledging some of the pain and the trauma and to be able to say that I'm feeling it and it's okay for us to talk about it. Um, some of that energy may come in into this conversation, not necessarily in contact. However, energy is currency. So maybe we can find a way to shift that into authenticity, more truth and vulnerability. And if not, that's okay too. So um, without any further ado, I want to talk about the next guest that we have on. His name is Preston Smiles. Preston Smiles, um, I've known about him for quite a while before we even started this podcast. He is one of the specific people that made me want to co-create this show. Nice. It made me realize, yeah, I never told you that, yeah. <laughs> him and Fabian were particularly. I was like, oh, there's people like that out there that are not on TV. And they're, for me, they're better than anybody on TV. And I was like, well, we got to get these people out there. Mm. And uh, so this show, a lot of it has to do with him in a in very interesting way. Yes. That's awesome. Um, I love his essence. I love his energy. He's an author of two books um, called Love Louder, Now or Never. Uh, he moved out of the hood for good, and you cannot blame him. He is a husband to a wonderful wife who is also a specialist in her field, a father of a beautiful son, two-year-old, and twins to come. And uh, he's about to turn 40 years old. That is 25 in black years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm talking too much, so go ahead and please introduce yourself. Oh, oh, rah! Let's go, fellas. Yes, yes, yes. It's really good to be here. Really, really good to be seen. Great and to have you, man. For yeah, sure. man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, this is a beautiful day. A beautiful day on so many levels. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging what, you, what, you, what was acknowledged in the beginning of the show, which is uh, the, the collective consciousness of, uh, let's call it, the world, but let's be even more specific of what's happening in Iran, what's happening in the U.S. is, uh, as we know, in the spiritual world, an opportunity for growth. And so um, I love and appreciate and celebrate the discomfort. I love and celebrate and appreciate when I stretch and what I see right now is all of us going into a stretching of like, who are we? What do we stand for? And how are we going to be in this world? Because, um, you know, this thing is a gift. And, and it could be here today and gone tomorrow. And uh, yeah, man. What's the biggest thing that's stretching you out in life currently? Um, it's particularly this, this subject, um, because for me... Um, it's important that people like me, and I'm going to call myself an influencer, a thought leader, whatever you'd like to call me, people who have big audiences and people watching, it's important for us to be transparent about what we feel and see and experience in the world. And as a ethnic, a Afro-amazing, a sexy chocolate drop, I have been... Um, Talk that shit. We need yes. to come up with some for our, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely make some Iranian versions of that. Right. Yes. Yes. Something laid to a carpet of some sort. Yeah. I have been aware uh -huh. that um, my energy and my views uh, can be seen as radical, can be scary to the fragile, um, let's call it context of the American ethos. And, and, I also understand that one of the best things you could do for anybody is speak to their listening. And so uh, for me, I've been, I decided that 2020 was going to be the year of A, um, family, and B, for me, uh, the most 
radical financial abundance I've ever experienced and abundance across the board. And a part of that was going to be, you know, I believe in a concept and I teach this principle, which is uh, elevation requires separation and uh, separation from ideas, separation from the small self, separation from um, toxic environments, not people, environments that no longer serve us, whatever the case may be. And a part of that on my social media was me coming out of the proverbial closet and declaring um, that I believe that the current president of the United States is a lunatic and not necessarily, or to me, doesn't have the best interest of the world or even the US in my opinion, right? And that's my opinion and I'm entitled to it. Uh, and so I decided to come out and have that conversation about climate change and about what's happening. And um, it brought out a, quite a few people who wanted to attack and come after me because you know we need to keep America great and make America great. And you know that's a whole nother conversation, bro. I'm just gonna leave it there for right now, but that's, that's what's swirling in my space right now. And as a world traveler, as somebody who's dated an Iranian girl, like I have a whole, you know, different perspective on humanity mm. and the, the distinction between America and humanity. Yeah. Can I touch on that? Because I've been thinking about that a lot. I always did, and especially yesterday specifically, I was talking to one of my friends and I'm like, I feel like a lot of these, like, you know, politician senators specifically that are pro-war, pro-Iran, I'm uh, not pro Iran actually. Anti Iran, pro pro America, just Amer like or a lot of the people. They just they have not experienced the world and they haven't been around and they haven't like talked to people from other cultures. They realize that they're human too, and ninety percent of everything that they do is just like us. They just see the the things that they don't like or they think they don't like, and they just want the things that they want to put in like in the in the in the headlines, and they keep repeating those things. You know, they attacked us. They did this. They did this. And a lot of them are just mostly factually wrong. And it's because they just don't fucking know, like, what's going on out in the world. And they just, America is so separate. And that's a very American idea, actually, that because, like, Europe, there's so many countries next to each other. Overlap. You know, overlap. But over here, it's, like, so far, it's its own part of the world, kind of separate. And America is great, but they forget that there's also a lot of great other people and countries out there in the world. And they just don't know about them, you know? So and in many it's ways, like, it's like we're in a bubble. And that's kind of what you were saying, that yeah. things are not theory. This is actually a living being, mm -hmm. that blood circulating. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a soul. And we need to understand that. And the only way we can is essentially with dialogue. So yes. it's important to have these conversations that just not stretches us, but also stretches the collective along the way, hopefully at least. Yes. So it's important to have these uncomfortable conversations. And I don't see that happening in schools. So somebody's got to do it. Mm -hmm. Thus, right. this podcast and anybody else who has medicine in their heart that they know they have to give to the planet. Right? Exactly. So. so thank you for um, acknowledging that. Thank you for speaking up for um, what people that look like me are feeling right mm -hmm. now. That I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and for dating an Iranian woman. So, <laughs> 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 so you talked about the small self. Yes. I don't know that for that some reason that stood out to me. Yep. I've uh, noticed that you talk about identity mm -hmm. a lot recently. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about a little bit more about that small self identity image ego that we start believing that is who we are and we create that a reality and operate based on? Yep. Yeah, and take it wherever you want to take it. Okay, awesome, man. Um, so I'm gonna break this down from my understanding of what the human is, right? So there's four parts to the human. So we are biological beings. Mm -hmm. We are um, linguistic beings. Mm -hmm. We build worlds with our language. Without the distinction called door and doorknob, trying to get out of here would be very difficult. But because I have uh, linguistics, I understand the concept of door and doorknob. Everything we do is in language, right? Then we are social and historical beings, which means we are born into beliefs and interpretations. Uh -huh. Now I'm gonna stop at that one for right now to break down what I mean between the distinction between the capital S of the self and the lowercase. And that could be replaced with the higher self and the wounded self, okay? So we're social and historical beings, which means we were born into beliefs and interpretations. Many of us never question the beliefs and interpretations that we were born into. And some of those beliefs and interpretations are very subtle. Yep. They, uh, they happen 
um, when our nervous systems are forming and they become of course for us, of course, mm-hmm. right? Of course. This is what you do. This is how you do it. Of course, black people are this. I call that the taken for granted truth. Yes, right? yes. Of course, money is the root of all evil. Mm-hmm. Of course, X, Y, and Z. There's millions of them. Correct. So I want to give an example uh, that'll be a kind of a funny one, but this is how someone listening would want to scan their lives. So I, be, I teach this stuff. I lead workshops all over the world. I write books. I speak. Yeah. I coach people. I do the whole thing, right? And uh, maybe about five years ago, um, nope, this was six and a half years ago. It was right, right around the time I met my, my wife. We started dating. Within a month, we moved in together. Um, two months, two months, we moved in together. And then um, there was a point where we moved to Venice and uh, I remember, you know, I've always been like a dude, just like a dude's dude. So like if it's late at night and I come home, I may even be sleeping in my jeans, let alone like doing all these like bathroom routines and stuff like that. And so I've started dating this girl who's a girl of my dreams and every night she'd be like, so, you're not going to brush your teeth? <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, I guess I am, right? And, and so we would, you know, go to brush our teeth together. And take in mind that I wouldn't see her brushing her teeth in the mornings because I would go surfing or be out early. I'm a morning person. I'm usually up by 5 a.m., up and on it, right? And so I began to notice that every time she would put toothpaste on the toothbrush, my entire body would cringe. It would be like I was had this crazy visceral, like, like, and I was like calculating. When she would put toothpaste on your toothbrush? On hers. On hers, okay. okay. Because she was squeezing so much. Oh, it was like, putting, okay. it was like in, my, in my mind, I was like, that's another $8. And like, you know, we're like sharing everything, right? And so I began to notice like, oh, every time she does this or, or like, let's say we're in the shower together and she's using the shampoo, and she like squeezes half you the bottle. Physically feel I'm it. like, oh, I want to like scratch my skin off kind of deal. And, you know, because I do this work, I decided to take a look. And I was like, let me think about this. Social and historical beings born into beliefs and interpretations. Let me think about this. And then I, I began to look. And, and then I, I realized that my ex-roommate in college, used, I, the same thing used to happen to me. We would share things. And if he would use a lot, it would trigger me. And I went back a little further. And then I thought about my mom. And I've always been one of those kids that's like, you know, like if my mom would have given me $5 for lunch, I'd say, no, no, I'll just, I'll just take two fifty. I don't need the rest. Right? And I never really cognized why I was like that. Well, it's, my nervous system was forming at a time where, and now catch this, my mom was born in Watts, California, in like a two-bedroom house with like eight people. She had to skip meals. She had rats and roaches crawling over her. There was a point at 13 where my mom started working and decided that she would never live like that again. And if she had kids, they wouldn't live like that. And so what my mom did was she worked her way out of the ghetto and moved us to Compton, right? Which at the time wasn't as bad as we think it is. And then from Compton, she moved us to Harper City, and there was a point where we had like seven BMWs and like houses everywhere. And I was that kid that had everything, right? But I, I never would like, I was never, tr- I never acted like a rich kid, even though I had everything. And what I recognized what was, was she doing? huh? What was she doing? What was her job? Mom? My mom was a CPA accountant and my dad was, um, he worked for aircraft. Uh, Hughes Aircraft, and he was also dealing drugs on the side and things of that okay, nature. So he made the money. She knew the loopholes because she was yeah, CPA. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Making a killer. And so what I recognized was, was that although my mom left the ghetto, what didn't leave the ghetto was her mentality. mentality. The lack and limitation, the scarcity mindset. Mm-hmm. And so my mom, I remember growing up thinking, and she would say this like, you know, all of this could go away, you know, and like hearing that enough and like, you know, we don't want to take advantage of anything. Hearing that enough m- created an aspect of me, let's call it the small self, the small S of the self, that 
was also operating from lack and limitation and scarcity. And so when my wife, girlfriend at the time, would put this toothpaste on, it wasn't just me showing up. It was all of that. Rats, roaches, watts, the whole thing, all showing up in a moment where she's putting toothpaste on a freaking toothbrush. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is a way that I would describe, and I'm going to do the fourth aspect of what it means to be human, just for those of you guys going, what's the fourth? Uh, we are quantum beings, yeah. right? So you guys understand biological, quantum, linguistic, and social and historical. And um, one of my favorite quotes, I remember reading this probably 10 years ago, and it stayed with me. Uh, it's from Ernest Holmes, uh, The Science of Mind. He said to get your, um, your answers questioned, no, your, your questions answered and your answers questioned. And that's something that I... Can you repeat that again? Yes. So, and I, when, I, when I read it, that's the same thing. I was like, what? It was like my mind went sideways, right? So Ernest Holmes said... You can bring your mic higher too. Um, to get your... Wait, let me say this. Your questions answered and your answers questioned. Yes. Right? Like that, mm -hmm. just that little piece mm -hmm. of like asking and rethinking, right? Mm -hmm. so it's why we call it the new thought movement. Right. Like asking ourselves, can I bring a new thought to this? The of course is, of course, and I'm going to do this and this is mean, of course, Iranian, Iranian people are terrorists. Okay, now if I have my American lens and I'm having that conversation, the new thought would be, why? Why? Where'd that come from? Where'd I get that? Is that true? Is that a capital T truth? Is that a fact? Or is that something I've been fed? Is it perhaps from my racist grandfather? Is it perhaps from Fox News that I've been watching every single day and the headlines I've been fed? Is it perhaps all the Disney films that I've watched where they make the dark character the bad one with the X, Y, and Z? Like how many, like that level of conscious thinking creates absolute freedom in my opinion. No, it's true. And, and, and I mean, in therapy, I, I, ca I call this dominant discourses. Mm. And before even getting into the trauma or the pain, what I'm really trying to find out is the universe that creates that human being. Boom. What is being said? Who is saying it? And mm. what is it getting powered by? Because yeah. there's somebody that's authorizing that message. Yes. And to look into that makes you realize that is this the truth that I want to live? Or is it the truth that the society, culture, family, yes. neighborhood is forcing upon me. Yes. And the realization of that creates some sort of a choice for the person. Mm -hmm. And essentially that turns into freedom. Now, a lot of things that you're saying is very interesting to me. And maybe one of the reasons that it resonates amongst many other reasons mm. is, I don't know if you're aware, if, uh, philosophically speaking, a lot of things that you talk about is very postmodern. It's based mm. on social constructivism. Are you, f are you familiar? Nope. Are you even aware? Nope. And even on a, on a smaller scale, it's narrative therapy, which is my uh, dominant theory in, in sessions, mm. which is essentially stories and meaning making. Mm -hmm. So um, the stories we tell, well, stories tell us, actually. Yeah. We don't tell stories. Yep. And that's based on how we make meanings. Two people could be in the same situation, but mm -hmm. one makes a different meaning, makes, somebody makes another meaning. Yep. And you're often talking about this. So you're saying you're not pulling anything from that philosophy mm -hmm. or narrative therapy, mm -hmm. but somehow you speak that language very well. Absolutely. That's one of the things. Like, So we have um, a workshop. Uh, two workshops. One is called the Bridge Experience, and the other one is called Extreme Leadership. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, um, therapists and uh, trauma specialists and people mm -hmm. like that will come for themselves, but they're also coming to see like, what the hell are we doing? Because in some so many ways, we have no formal training, and yet every single time, and I've had people at the highest levels with mm -hmm. like come in and be like, do you know that you just blended? This, 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 yeah. and this, yeah, and like, not really, right. and yet, yes, uh -huh. and a lot of our work um, is trial and error, evidence based. It's, it's self. Uh -huh. It's you know, I've been coaching and in the human game for right. a long time. I was an actor before any of this. I have a master's degree 
in theater, uh -huh. oh, nice. which is basically psychology. I, I, I saw you on Entourage a couple of weeks ago at my friend's house. I was like, oh, yeah. that, that's Preston Smart. I was like, who the fuck is Preston Smart? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and one of the bigger biggest scenes, by the way, right? That's yeah, a yeah. very monumental moment when Ari's coming with the water gun in the office. Yes. And, and he's hiding Lloyd, his assistant. Yeah. Which, by the way, that show can't be remade in this time. No, of course not. <laughs> the Me Too movement would destroy right. that. But it was so surprising for me to see you, and I had no idea you were acting. Yeah. But not to get off subject. You know what's more interesting about about that uh -huh. is, is I was doing a talk at Burning Man and Adrian Grenier, the lead actor right. of Entourage, Entourage was there. And after it was over, we kind of went back and forth from the stage because he challenged me on something and I just came with this. Like, yeah. and, and He's so, doing a lot of conscious stuff himself. Exactly. So we met up and we're friends now and we nice. hang out and talk and like, uh, but yeah, he came up after and was like, I need to know you. And I was like, actually... Actually, we were on the same show together a long time ago. Uh, it was dope. But yeah, man. No, I, this is all trial and error. This is me just uh, poking and seeing what works and what doesn't and being willing to let go. And I think that, to me, is... is and I'll say this. My intention, um, my, my mission, my vision for me as a man mm -hmm. is to be the living embodiment of God's love as a father, husband, and transformational coach. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that's a weapon, and 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 that, to me, that's all of our duties. It's like, mm -hmm. how can I be a weapon? Like, how can I be so um, tapped in, and turned on, and leaned in that whatever is needed in any given moment, I have it available, right? Because a lot of people become one one track. They're like, oh, it's only NLP. It's only this. It's only that. It's like, no, bro, it's yeah. everything. Yeah. Who do you need to be right now? Exactly. Let's go. Yeah. Exactly. That's beautiful. Uh, l l let's get a little bit um, closer um, and step away from um, theory and say, we're talking about stories and, and you really emphasize on stories yourself. Yeah. How do you help people? How do you help yourself step away from that smaller self stories and start entering into the preferred story? And if you could make it mm -hmm. somewhat digestible for the people that are listening, where they could be like, oh, I want to use this today. For sure. I have a methodology called the catch and release, uh -huh. um, and it essentially states, and I'll say this, the, the underbelly of everything that I teach is celebration, celebrating the catch, yeah. celebrating the, the notice, right. right? Because the moment I'm in celebration, that is a very particular vibration. And so, um, I'm going to think of an example. Um, hmm. Okay. So... Uh, Every once in a while, my wife and I get into it, and you know, being the double Leo that I am, sometimes I can get really hot-headed. Yeah. And one tracked, I can think I know, mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's one of the biggest issues in relationship in general is this idea that, and I I teach this, and yet I fall into it sometimes, and I say that the moment I think I know my wife. Our relationship is dead. It's over. Mm -hmm. There's no more relationship if I think I know her. Because there's no space. Because you know everything about her. There's nothing else. Okay. No space. I know. And so I sometimes I get in that space where I'm like, yeah, you did that last time. And of oh. course. Yeah, and right? Of course. <laughs> and so how I get myself out of that is I change my physiology immediately. And breathing and physiology sometimes go hand in hand for me. I'll instantly catch like, oh, you're not breathing, which... Fight, flight, freeze, and appease, right? The moment, the moment uh, the amygdala, wounded ego, believes that it is under threat, it goes into fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze, and then the new one, that is the modern one, is appease, mm -hmm. right? And so recognizing that, oh, I'm in fight right now, and, which means I'm not breathing, Let's put, some, let's put some oxygen back in the brain because the more air we have, the more choice we have. So oxygen, physiology, change, move. I'll literally turn sideways. I'll jump up and down. I'll beat my chest a little bit just to like move the energy, yeah. just allow it to be because, you know, energy is energy. It is so much harder to like when you're tense, for sure. It's like definitely harder to oh, like yeah. you make worse decisions and it's harder to make decisions than I like, think, you know, in general. Yeah. It's crazy, bro. And then... Uh, you're essentially talking about the breath and only the breath right now, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'll allow myself to have more oxygen in my brain, my body, the whole thing. And then change my physiology, change where I'm standing, how I'm looking, the whole thing. And then um, depending on how heated the situation is, I'll remove myself completely. Um, if 
I have a semblance because th there's many schools of thought in science that say that it takes 20 minutes for the nervous system to come back to equilibrium. And so uh, knowing that, I'll remove myself for 20 minutes and start to look for all the ways that I was responsible for what just happened. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is the most important part, celebrate that I am in this now moment in that conversation. Right? Celebrate it. Because I think the distinction and the thing where people get messed up is they do something stupid or somebody does something stupid to them. They fall into victim or villain or whatever the, the case may be. The story starts developing. Exactly. Yeah. And they what do you don't... mean by celebrate? Like, I'm happy, like, okay, I'm happy that I'm, I'm in this situation right now? Yeah, like sense. giving yourself okay. credit. Mm -hmm. Not even happy, but just credit. I'm like, going to get something out of it, yeah. basically. Like, like look, I'm, I'm going to learn from this. Let, let me give you my version of that so I can yeah. just meet you eye to eye. Um, I look at that as a sparkling moment, as a moment of exception to the problem story, which is essentially a door to the new story. So yep. if you really listen to the client, they're talking about this problem-saturated mm -hmm. story, and my life is this, and my dad is that. But if you really listen carefully, you're going to find the moment that the problem was not the problem. Mm -hmm. And if you open that door and ask good enough questions, the client will start shifting into that story. Sure. Or so meaning it's a, it's a learning experience for the person? No, no, or it's, no? it's something that you already do. Mm -hmm. So say you're doing, you're saying you think you're a fuck-up, and you're doing horrible things. But within that story that you're telling, there's a moment that you're like, but you know what? I got out of bed. Oh, gotcha. And, and I mm -hmm. went to the store. You've been at home for six days. You've been, been depressed. How'd you do that? Like, what made you get out of the door? How, mm -hmm. did, how did you stop depression from telling you X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. He's like, well, you know what? I, at that moment, I was like, fuck it. Whatever happens, happens. Fuck it. Whatever happens, happens. All of a sudden turns into, fuck everything. I'm going to live the life that I'm I want. I'm going to do live. this. Yeah. It turns yeah. into super positive. Is, is, is okay. that? Yeah. That, okay. Yeah, okay. for sure. And then um, it becomes about taking responsibility, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces because if I'm placing blame instead of taking responsibility, mm -hmm. then I, whoever I'm placing the blame on has my power. If I'm taking responsibility, even if it was somebody, like for instance, somebody hit my, I brought a, a 2020 Escalade, right? Three weeks ago. Uh -huh. This past weekend, pulled up in Venice to a coffee shop. As I got out, I was like, ah, oh, this is on a main street. Had the thought, right? And you can say I created it. <laughs> Freaking come back, somebody hit my car. Now, I wanted to say, asshole, no one out of integrity, uh, 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 and blame, blame, blame. But instead, I took responsibility, and instantly I had my power back. Mm -hmm. And by taking responsibility and saying, okay, well, you made that choice, and now there's a consequence to the choice, and, and, P, you have a 2020 Escalade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's kind of dope. Yeah. Like, how blessed are you? And all of this stuff means nothing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have love, if you're not actually allowing yourself to experience the fullness of this life, and yo, P, you yeah. are. So how about that? It literally transformed my day. Mm -hmm. I could have been <coughs> down and out for a while. Right. And it was like 35 seconds of me like, Ugh! and then, <laughs> nope, good. We'll Ooh. get it fixed. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. What happened in the car? Um, somebody tried to pull in a parking spot. And, how bad is it? Uh, not too bad. Bumper. Okay. Back bumper. It's like black scratches from the... I saw the girl pull off. I just didn't know that she had just hit my car. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. It actually says you... Like, I literally looked her in the eyes. Um, like 10 seconds could have been avoided. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have a... Our time with you is limited, so I'm not going to even try to think of segues or wait for segues. Still but um, <laughs> I personally love to uh, hear more um, about you talking about masculinity. Yes. And the work that you do with men mm -hmm. and how that how important that is to the times that we're living. Mm. In many ways, um, masculinity has been um, suppressing many things, including its own femininity, mm. right? And the femininity that we deny in ourselves, we're projecting onto our woman, yep. which is essentially shooting ourselves in our own foot. Yeah. Um, so you're doing a lot of big workshops. That T-shirt, yes, is that what? It, yeah, yep, it's us, Conscious Man Brotherhood, C and B. Great logo, by the iron way. Iron sharpens iron. Yes, I sir. love that. So can you talk a little bit about the work that you do with men and how important that is for men to start going into that space? Absolutely, man. Thank you. I mean, let's acknowledge the elephant in the room. Men are killing themselves, like actually, literally, and slowly mm -hmm. more than women are. And the reason for that, there's many. 
uh, we can call it nature and we can call it what nurture. Do you, what do you mean by that? Kill them themselves? Like literally? Yeah. Like okay. the suicide rate, it's, mm. it's four oh, times okay. for men than it is for women. And we die 10 years or five to 10 years earlier? We die earlier. Mm-hmm. All the, everything is lower. Like we're not doing as well as women. And uh, I want to point to nurture over nature for right now. Okay. The, the way we nurture little boys is by the time you're usually seven, eight, you've heard big boys don't cry enough. And then you go and hang out with, even if you didn't hear that, but you go play sports, you hang out with some other boys, and they grew up in a Western culture, you're going to hear, don't be a pussy, don't be a fucking faggot, man up, Mm. enough, where by the time you're 15, you have lost that. And by the time you're 28, you no longer know how to even get to it. Remember how you said in high school, like, mad dogging was a thing? Yeah, it was crazy. (laughs) Like, you felt like you had to do it. (laughs) So like walk, walk across the quad and just yeah. mad. I'm like, and I would think about it. It's funny. What the fuck do we think that's like what you're supposed to do? Uh, yes. Like, I tried let's it a couple times. Like, what am I doing? Or like fights and just like big groups and just go like, you know, let's go by their school and like, yeah. what the fuck? Right. Yeah. So um, because um, let's, let's do this a few ways. Mm-hmm. One of the things I point to, and I'll use my own story for example, <laughs> but it's my belief that well-intentioned mothers have uh, unconsciously beat out the masculine. And because of that, the porn industry is booming. Because of that... Let's, let's repeat that sentence yes. one more time. Because as soon slow, as I heard porn, I forgot down. like what happened before. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I went straight... Lady, right? What did he say about porn? <laughs> it's the lady in the red dress in Matrix. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Slow it down for us, please. So it is my um, assessment uh-huh. that well-intentioned mothers beat out the masculine of their little boys and the parts of what she, they, believed man was wrong for out of their little boys. And because of that, the porn industry is booming and sex trafficking is booming. Now, I'm going to go into that. I'm going to use my story for example. When I was young, my mom, uh, I remember being like six and we'd be walking down the street, and she'd say, Preston, where am I standing? And I'd say, uh, I don't know. You're standing on the street, Mommy. And she'd say, no, I'm standing on the outside. And you never let a woman stand on the outside. You protect your when you're women. When you cross in the street. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I had a cousin do that. With you know, me. Or on the sidewalk. Just any, like, a woman's always on the inside of you. Because if a car is going to come and hit, it needs to hit the man first and kill him first so he protects the women and the children, right? So what she's doing, this is a beautiful thing. She's trying to create a gentleman, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Unconsciously, she was teaching me that whenever women are around, I am on duty. I can't be me when women are around. My feelings, my life doesn't matter as much when women are around. Like, let this sink in. Mm-hmm. Now, year after year, this type of conditioning and programming was happening. So what I began to do as a little boy was I was this angel at home and a fucking nightmare outside. Mm -hmm. And because there was no um, Hmm. rites of passage like we've created with Conscious Man Brotherhood with Man Cave Junior and things of that nature, because those things didn't exist, I learned how to be a man from TV from Ultimate Warrior, from Hulk Hogan, from the G.I. Joes, from Mr. T, from all of these ideas, Clint Eastwood, everything that was perfect about man was a very particular thing. They always had the right answers. They were always stoic, never emotional, never lost their shit. And if they did, it was in sports and that was okay. And this is a whole nurture campaign for how we treat little boys. Now remember, if you have somebody doing the same thing for 10, 15, 20 years, it's gonna be quite the uphill challenge to unprogram some of that stuff. And remember, our nervous systems are forming, our psyches are forming between zero and six, seven, eight. And so the work that I do with men is helping them return back to the warrior king, that the, the deep lover, the mystic, the full energy in a productive, integrated way. I teach men how to be bigger than their dicks. I teach men how to be bigger than alcohol and drugs and coffee and anything else that has their mm-hmm. power. Mm-hmm. Not because those things are wrong, but because you, you, 
our duty as men is to evolve the species. Our duty is also to protect. Women's thing is nurture, right? There's something eternal, internal that happens. The moment I found out my wife was pregnant, I doubled my income. I hear that over and over like, from a lot talk. of people. Yeah. Instantly, just woof, right? So what does that mean now that you have twins? Oh, man, it's on. <laughs> Three million, 2020, let's go. Yo, mm. I'm, I'm dead ass serious. Yeah, yeah. So the work that I do with men, uh, we have a workshop called Unleash the Beast, which happens every couple months in Australia, the U.S. Uh, we'll be taking it to Canada and the U.K. Um, all of that. And then I have online programs, Man Cave, a uh, free program uh, called The Pack. Uh, on Facebook, uh, all of that is about helping us return back to um, our wholeness. Yeah, complete right. weapons, mm-hmm. right? Love, yes. like love. Everything comes back to love when mm-hmm. it's all said and done. And uh, then allowing us to have a place to go, to put things. Most men, real talk, most men don't have friends. You guys are really fortunate to have each other. Most men. Mm. And we're, I'm talking about thousands at this point that I've helped support. Yeah. You're talking about like everybody has friends, but you mean like real, they like, they they like you could talk to, yeah. cry. If something like went down in the middle show. of the night, they couldn't say, yo, I'm not home. Go take, go take care of my wife. They don't have that person. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't have somebody they can say, yo, I need $10,000 right now. I'm going through it. X, Y, and Z. They don't have that yeah. person. They have a dude they play basketball with every once in a while on the weekends. Mm. They have people at work that they talk about sports with. About but bullshit. They don't, yeah, exactly. Small talk. They yeah. don't have a space yeah. to talk about the date rate. To be fearlessly like, share emotions yes. and then go talk about it. They don't inside. have a space to talk about them being molested. Mm. Right? We do um, trauma-based workshops. And we go into the depths. And n- I'd say 80 to 90% of the rooms, men or women, same thing. Molested mm. as a child done really messed up things to women, self-included, mm. all of those, right? Things that I will um, carry for life. Not heavy, but the things I did, mm-hmm. things that have been done to me. And for me, this is why I do this work, because I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to carry that heavy burden and to not tell anybody, mm-hmm. to feel so much pain, to feel so much shame, to have a man even try to touch you and you just want to punch him. Mm-hmm. I know yeah. what that feels like. Right? And so for me, that's, that's my job. Well, we've had guests on this show when I just talk the way I talk and they kind of get triggered. Yes. And I'm like, well, it's like, you know, you're, you're talking with too much calmness and, and, and peacefulness and that triggers me. You know, yeah. Because like, like, it's funny because I, <laughs> like, hugging and like, I, like right. I have that with a lot of uh, my friends, but I don't have it as much with my brother, especially with my oldest brother. Yes. Like, not much at all. It's because, like, and I feel like because we don't really have it with my dad maybe mm-hmm. that much. I don't know what it is. Like, yep. we love each other. We're super close, but we don't, like, the hugs are just like, yeah. I'm thinking uh, about that yeah. brother like, scene you know? at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know, but... Even even with the moms, like, I, know, I know a lot of people are, like, super, like, you know, a lot of, like, kissy, huggy, super like that with mom. Like, you know, we're not even that... That much like that with her mom, you know? Up but, until but, 20, like, 25 years ago, I think, maybe 30, they used to think that the reason people become schizophrenic is because of the way mom, the, the mothers hug their children, which they didn't really mean it because it wasn't all them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like, right now, like, 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 like not when I was a kid, like, you know, uh, but as, as a grown man, like, we always, like, you know, it's, it's Iranian thing, we, like, kiss the side of his face, hug my mom, and I love it every time. But, like, I see some people older, I see different. Like, they just, like, hug. I don't know. It's just different. Or they kiss on the lips right. with their moms and stuff like that. And just stuff like that. That just sounds, like, seems crazy to me, you know? A little woman uh, baby did that. Yeah. Anyway. But, yeah, continue. <laughs> no, that's, to, yeah. that's a big deal, mm-hmm. what you're talking right. about. It's very important. <clears throat> and what happens for a lot of men, especially, is when they had their first kid, they realize all the things they didn't get. And then they try to make up for it. Mm-hmm. And you fall so madly in love with these kids and, and your wife, of course. Mm-hmm. But like there's something so pure about your child. Like last night I kissed my son probably 150 times. <laughs> I tackled him. I, I just bite him. I bite his feet. I do the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my, my dad, rest in peace, um, I remember being 15 years old and getting out of the car. Um, and he kissed me on the lips. Mm. And I got out. It was normal to me. It was a, of course. Yeah. And I got out of the car. And my friends were like, the fuck? Bro, did your dad just kiss you on the lips? Mm. I'm like, yeah. It's my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some gay ass shit right there. I didn't do it again. 
That's crazy. I didn't do it again. Especially at that age with friends, you know? Yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. But like, wow. my dad modeled for me the t- what um, secure love looks like. It's beautiful. And of course, culturally, things are different, right? Like, yeah. Preston, can, can we talk about yeah. dad for a little bit? Yeah. Because recently he left his physical body, yep. right? And I, I kind of watched how you, you, you've been dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was very interesting to me. I'm um, from far, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about, I don't even like to call it a grieving process because that's not your language and that's not honoring you. I mean, if that's your word, that's you your can word. Use it. But, you know, maybe remembering him in a different way. <coughs> um, w- 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 but it seemed like, f- at least from looking from the outside, that yeah. you, you really dealt with it in a very interesting and a different way. How did you do it? How did you go about it? A lot of people deal with loss and sometimes they're stuck in that. And it's one of the most difficult things to work with in therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, my dad passed away. um, I was at Burning Man. Mm -hmm. So it was August 28th. You at Burning Man when it happened? Yep. He texts me. So we found out that we... August, just about, what, five, six months ago. Yep. He Natural t- causes? I mean, or did uh, you, were you kind yeah, of expecting it? Yes and no. Exactly. Okay. I was kind of expecting it, uh, but it was also, he did it to himself. And so there was a little bit of anger there because sure. he knew that if he smoked cigarettes, having COPD, that's like just throwing lighter fluid onto an already lit fire. And he did it anyway. Mm-hmm. And so he died. Um, now, with that said, he, um, we found out on the Tuesday of Burning Man that it was a boy and a girl. Because we didn't know. So everybody, the whole family, everybody's waiting. What are the twins? Is it, is it two boys? Is it boy girl, two girls? Whatever. So we find out. My wife texts me. Uh, she messages him. I message him. He calls me. I missed the call. So he sends me a text. And he says, uh, and he, uh, he leaves a voice note. The voice note is just like, he says, Ham, Ham, Ham. Because my nickname was Hammer. Because I had a hammer head as a kid. I am so happy, boy. I'm over here in tears. I'm so excited. Yes, yes, yes. And he's just overjoyed. And then he texts me, same thing. I'm in tears right now. I'm so proud. I'm so happy, right? Now, I couldn't have asked for a better, like, last words, you know, from my dad. Um, It sucked. I'll start with that. It sucked. And I got a concussion the day after. I got back because I went to go surfing to clear my brain, and I got hit with a surfboard mm. in the head. And so um, it, was like, it was like compounding, like what is happening? And I realized and recognized uh, one of my favorite quotes that I hadn't even thought about for years. And I was sitting in this hyperbaric chamber trying to heal my brain, and this quote just popped back into my mind. And it, it says... Ever since my house burned down, I see the moon more clearly. And that's exactly how I feel right now. Everything, not everything, a lot of things burned down. We lost a baby. We lost a baby in 2019. I got a concussion in 2019. My grandmother died and then my dad died a month later. All in 2019. And so all of that, all that did was remind me of what really matters. And it almost was like rocket fuel to my mission, to my love, to my presence. I already, and I'm gonna tell you guys this, I've seen people die bloody deaths. And when you've had that opportunity, that gift, which didn't feel like a gift at that time, but when you've seen somebody's brain splattered on the ground and them fighting to be here, you, it changes your chemistry. Yeah. I have never been the same since that moment. And this was like three, four years ago. So my, the way I enter life after seeing that and then how I treated my dad after seeing that, everything. I've been very present with people, deeply like, okay, we're here, right? Because whew, this shit can be gone. Boom, I've seen it. And I also know that there's a part of us, because she was fighting. This woman who, who died in my arms, essentially, in New York City on Mother's Day, she was fighting for her life. It was a car accident? Yep. Mm. She got hit, flipped in the air, boom. And I knew, just a little side story, I wasn't supposed to be there. I'm doing quotes here. I wasn't supposed to be there. And yet my intuition guided me 
across town to a Barney's. I went upstairs. I got to the third floor. I'm looking at these boots. Something says, go back down. I go back down. I walk out the door. Ten seconds later, skirt! Oh, no! Boom! Instantly, as she hit the ground, I knew why I was there. There was a doctor, a nurse, and me. Got it. Blood splattering out, <laughs> trying to live. It's like, yep, I got the spiritual side. You guys take the doctor and nurse thing? Mm-hmm. Well, you have the nervous system side as well because it takes an interesting nervous system to be able to stay with that and yes. not want to disappear. Yes, because everybody was, you know, this kind of yeah. thing. Like, oh, like, it just, the streets right. cleared because it was gory. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm telling you that to tell you, to sort of let you in on my grieving process. There was some anger. Um, I allowed myself to experience the anger. I allowed myself to let, let it complete. What did that look like? Um, primal screams. It looked like crying. It looked like um, just having conversations. You know, I know, I know, this is not belief, I know that we don't die. We die to the, to the she- shell case. And you're saying these out loud? Yes. In where? My car, okay. um, workshops, like, oh, I'm very... This is you dealing with this after? Yes. With yourself? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, and so, I just feel so much gratitude, man, that I got a dad that lived to 71 years old, that I got a chance to um, tell him I loved him, and not, not just tell him, but, like, create a relationship, you know? And I don't know if you guys still have your dads, but, like, bro, that's one of the best things to find out. Like, my dad told me the first time he free-based crack cocaine in an apartment in Hollywood in 1978, and he told me the whole story, right? Like, just to know, like, the, him as the man, mm-hmm. like, like, which is really a boy, right? Like, my dad was cheating and selling drugs and doing all this thing, and it gave me perspective. It helped me see. This was a little kid that had no guidance. He didn't have a dad, and so he guessed his way through. No guidance. And then he had me. And guess what? What he did, what he lacked in certain areas, he more than filled by being my basketball coach, my soccer coach, my football coach, the dude who drove us to the freaking skating rink, the dude who was there all the time, the dude who kissed me on the lips at 15, that dude. And so, bro, I'm like, I get so excited because, and he got to meet my son. We broke the cycle. I never met a grandfather. He never met a grandfather. And probably the one before that never met a grandfather because all of them died or left. Yeah. I'll die not having ever met a grandfather. Mm. But my son will have pictures and videos and, and like have all this connection yeah. with his grandfather. Yeah, my dad, I mean, God bless him. He's still alive. He's 84, 85 now. Wow. But we never like had, like again, we weren't that close to have that type of relationship. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I don't know, I guess because we're talking about nature and nur- nurture, my nature side always like, felt like that's the right way. So yes. I just felt like that's how I want to be with my kids and I want to yes. have like a more emotional connection with them yeah. and like have the things that I didn't have with my father, you know, because even to this day, every time I talk with my dad, it's like the same conversation. We talk about the same things and it just feels like small talk, you know? Yes. It feels like we're not talking about anything like deeply internal and, you know. It but sucks. that's on you, bro. Yeah. I'm going to call you forward on this because while you got a dad, you got to beat that. I had to beat that. My yeah. dad and I, we didn't talk for two years. Then he fixed things by asking me about the Lakers. Mm. Uh, how's, how's the Lakers? You been watching the Lakers? <laughs> he didn't apologize. He didn't say yeah. nothing. Just, <laughs> yeah, you know, you been watching basketball. Like, um, what did he ask about the Lakers? Do you remember? He's asking, have I been watching it? And I'm like, uh, yeah. What'd yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I got it. And I'm like, okay, this yeah. is your apology. You just don't know how because I'm your son. Yeah. And like, you want to dominate me. Uh-huh. And so... How I connected with my dad was not because he was ready. Yeah. It was because I would move through his bullshit. Mm. I'd be like, okay, I hear you. And what was the happiest time of your life? What was the saddest time of your life? What was the most fucked up thing you've ever done to another human? Mm. Yeah. What's the greatest thing you've ever done? <clears throat> Hearing him answer that gave me life. Mm. And it gave him life. It was a gift to my dad. Yeah. Same thing for my mom. I always think like it's my... Um because my dad's he's he's older and he's kind of pre dementia, yeah. Alzheimer's type thing. So I feel like it's too late, but maybe I'm just making excuses. It's not too late. I don't know, man. Find out. But some might slip out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I like to, I want to have that because a lot of things I learned on my own through just writing poetry and writing mm-hmm. songs and stuff like that because it's a generally self reflection. So I learned to really embrace emotions and like 
crying. I have no problem with crying. Mm -hmm. Last night with everything that was happening with Iran, almost the war happened and all this stuff happened. And I was fine. I was going to get tear eyed here and there. And then the thing that the straw that broke the camel's back, I heard that one of my fans, she was on, on, a, on a flight that crashed. There's a Ukrainian flight that was flying outside of Iran and it crashed. And as soon as I heard that, I just broke out. Man. I couldn't stop crying for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And I kept like stopping. I would start again. And, yeah. you know, and it's, it's, it's very therapeutic. And I, you know, yeah, I believe bro. in it. And I just wish more people would be accepting of that. And I think oh, yeah. We're kind of going that direction now, hopefully. We are. Yeah. We are. And, th and thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah. a, that's a big deal. Um, and I'm sure it felt really good. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though it sucked. It, and thank you for sharing your story with your father, man. I yeah. It. yeah. Thank you. Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. As authentic as always. Would you, there's a lot of things I'm sure that makes you successful, but would you say your authenticity would be the highest? I would say that. I would say it makes me the freest. Authenticity uh, does? Yeah. It's because, you know, in this social media sort of world, we can play games. We can make it look a certain way. And to me, that's a prison. And so um, what I know, and people get mad at me sometimes. They're like, you're the love guy, but you curse. You're the love guy, but you say you'll punch somebody. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I'll fuck somebody up. Right. I don't want to. Right. I'm still an animal. Yeah. St I'll still protect my family. Right. right. So if you come into my space, sometimes I may ignore it. Sometimes I may namaste you. And sometimes I may be like, really? That's where you want to go? Yeah. I think that's the issue, like not knowing that there's there could be balance between things, you know? Yeah. You could be this guy and that guy. You don't have to be just like either. Yeah, I'm not you know? one dimensional. Yeah. And so, yes, it's helped me be really successful, bro, because I, I don't have to pretend anything. It's just like what's here is my truth for now. Now, the degree of that, it's all relative. But I mean, I'm sure some people that are having a hard time owning who they are, are mm -hmm. watching you right now, it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, easy for you to say for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you draw a parallel how it's not even easy for you in some ways? Or what was the work that you did and where were you and where are you today yep. in, that, in that path of embracing who you are? Uh, yep. You know, I'm still working on that myself in mm -hmm. the process of developing my business. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm finding myself sometimes um, worry about criticism, judgment, mm -hmm. right? Which in a weird way stops me from entering into my flow state. Yep. It's like this shit's coming to me and I'm not putting it out for whatever reason that is. You know, now I may have good reasons to justify the bullshit, <laughs> but they're bullshit. Um, there's been a few times that your voice was in my head, believe it or not, right? Mm -hmm. I follow the, the coaching stuff that mm -hmm. you do. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know, like sometimes when I hear your voice, I'm like, oh, just fucking do it. Yep. So you're definitely a master in that level. And for me not Thank to you. really get you to talk about this would mm -hmm. be really stupid of me. Yeah. Please tell me what does it look like and let's hear your texture, your fabric of this conversation. Yep, this is easy. So I'm going to give you a short answer and then we can pull it out a little bit. So, because uh, I coach coaches. Mm -hmm. I help coaches build businesses. It's called Kaboom Coaching mm -hmm. and I have another thing called the League which nobody can get to. It's invitation only, right? And this is for high level coaches who want to take it to another level. And so, how I help and this is for me, and I help other coaches do this, but I'll say for me, one of the reasons why I'm so consistent and persistent and so passionate is because I don't, one, make it about me, two, in that I know that there are millions of people every day who are suffering, slow, slow suffering, and any moment, any minute that I do not honor what is handwritten on my soul, right? Because the universe, right? The same energy, the same intelligence that is open and available to Einstein is also open and available to me. When it hits me, when I get the tap, if I don't honor that tap to me, I am adding to their suffering. I am adding to their suicide. I am adding to their slow deaths. I am adding to the pain that their parents, their kids feel. I am adding to the universal anguish that is happening underneath everything. So it's heavy for me if I don't. All I need to do is reframe it every time. Now, the part I add in is I'm stealing from my kids. I'm robbing my kids if I don't step forward. And I used to do this when I didn't even have a kid, but it got more potent when I did. And how do you thicken this 
truth? How do you go deep into it without everybody may be like, okay, I yeah. know, but it's beyond the knowing. How do you turn the knowing into an experience? Here it is, right here. Everybody practices something a lot, right? Okay. The more you practice, the better you get. You rap, right? Yeah. I suck at rapping. But I guarantee you, if I stayed with you for six months and got mentorship from you and, and swam in your energy and did that every day, even if I sucked, that at the end of that six months, I'd have a new practice. And if you put me in the game, I could, I could probably play. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So for me, and for anybody out there who's going, oh, I can't. Well, you can. You're practicing something right now. And there's a lot of things. Anybody listening to this, any one of us could walk in your house, could step in your shoes, and shadow you at your job, and we would suck at the things that you do. Right. It's all a practice. Mm -hmm. Right? In this particular field, I am a great white, and most of you are guppies. And that's okay. You just got to keep eating and keep swimming with the sharks. Get help. Yes. Get that's... fucking help. Yes. Environment. Isolation grows the problem. Real talk. I, I, re I, I say this on my sales calls. Mm -hmm. I remind people that uh, <clears throat> the condition of the soil determines the productivity of the seed. Mm -hmm. The distinction between a, a, a seed which holds the entire blueprint for the tree. The distinction or the difference between one that grows 100 feet in the air and provides for thousands of people, shade, food, the whole thing, adds to the ecosystem, and one that grows three feet in the air and dies and shrivels up. The environment. Is the environment. It's the soil. They both have this, this, the blueprint is there. It's the soil they're planted in. And soil, is everything. It's what you listen to. It's what you eat. It's what you drink. It's who you hang with. It's do you, right? I know people, and I say this when somebody's like, well, I don't have the money. I'm like, you have an iPhone in your hand right now. You have a Gucci purse. You have Nike shoes. None of those things have an ROI. None of them do on the ROI of coaching. Anybody who's ever done anything extraordinary, anything, has a mentor, has a coach, has somebody tapping on the shoulder saying, hey, what about that? Hey, I have three coaches right now. I'm a million dollar, I have a million dollar business and I have three coaches right now for business, for relationship, for personal. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? You still working with John? Yes. He's good, huh? Yep. Hell yeah. He's amazing. What do you like about him? Um, if it's not too personal. No. Mm -hmm. Freaking, and we're talking about John Wineland. Um, he is, I like his groundedness. I like that he is, he mixes modalities. I appreciate his realness. And uh, yeah, he's just wise, man. That dude's tapped in and dropped in. And he's a master. He does one thing every day. If you do the same thing every day, no matter what it is, that if you just do like this, you, your bicep's going to get bigger if you just keep doing that over and over again. And John is a master of one particular thing in an amazing way. Which is? Relationship. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so he's mm -hmm. helped and supported Alexi and I through some beautiful times and some fucked up times. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The whole coaching, uh, I'm glad we, had, we did this with you because I've never had a coach for anything in my life. You yeah. know, like sports, I played basketball on my own here and there. I was never like, you know, like into a, in a team and yeah. stuff like that. Yep. And whatever I learned and did, it's just because I had interest and I mm -hmm. just wanted to do it myself. I ended up being a coach to a lot of the younger musicians and stuff like that. I'm still doing, I got my team and stuff like that. Yeah. But because I have a real estate business too. And on that side, I remember when I was starting years ago, a lot of people were like, oh yeah, I got to get a coach. And I was just like, it's bullshit. Like, you know, I didn't believe in it. Because I would see a lot of people that have coaches and they weren't doing any business uh -huh. a lot less than the people who don't have coaches, yeah. you know, so easy, like easy to just like dismiss it, you yeah. know. But, um, but it makes sense. I mean, it definitely makes sense that it could definitely benefit to have someone there with you and uh, just like, I don't know how to put it into words, but I yeah. totally like, it makes a per perfect For sense sure. to me now. Let me, and I want to challenge you: didn't have an official coach. Yeah, yeah nobody yeah. does anything in a vacuum and in a bubble. <clears throat> yeah, and so. Even if it was your girlfriend at the time saying, "Baby, you can do this." Yeah, yeah, for right? sure. No, I agree. Or the contractor saying, "Hey, you're gonna usually we would fuck you on this, but let me teach you something since you're new to real estate. Let mm. me show you something." Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Right? Any mentor, moment like yeah. that is a coach and a mentor. Yeah, 
I'm just talking about making it more official. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, like, this guy on his own, like, he's just like, with music, with a lot of stuff, like, not, in that sense, definitely. Like, I've had mentors and people like that. Yeah. But yeah, someone to like hire on a specific thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's beautiful. Beautiful. Um, what time is it? We're at 101. So we're at the end, right? Yeah. Um, I had a few more questions. So if you could just give me like a one or two sentence response to these yeah. random ass topics, yeah. that would be great. I know it's not going to do justice. Um, <laughs> it looks like the highest viewed video on YouTube you have is about stop smoking weed. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? So interesting, right? Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, yeah. Make it as short as you like. It's, I'm not trying to take That just time. speaks to, you know, some of the ethos of who's on YouTube and uh-huh. what they want to learn and why they want to learn it. And for me, uh, as I know that I'm, you know, multifaceted and, and that's a part of the journey. I don't care how somebody enters my world as long as they get in my world, right? If, I, if, if who I be speaks to their listening, whether it's a porn video or a YouTube, uh, not porn video, but like a video on how to stop porn or a video on how to stop smoking weed or a video on, you know, how to let go and let God. I don't care any of those channels as long as I can get in your space and remind you of who and what you really are, which is pure, unadulterated love. That's beautiful. Um, You've been talking about the snakes and the haters recently? Yep. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Um, Short and sweet. Haters are confused admirers. And they, they make us better. Mm-hmm. And I love them. I love everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, this is the balance right there. Yeah. Yeah. And you're a new father, relatively speaking, like two-year-old, and then you have a, a set of twins on the way. Is that scary? Very. very. It's scary and exciting. Because one kid will just punch you in the face. Anybody who's a parent knows this. It is deeply challenging uh-huh. like and amazing. It's the best love I've ever experienced. It's like drugs, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And twins is a whole nother beast. We had a dog, and I got rid of the dog when we found out we were having twins. I was like, my brother did that. Yeah. After that, the second one, they got rid of the, um, yeah. It's so much. It's a lot, bro. Mm-hmm. So and I'm you excited. You jumped a level too. You went from one to three. You know, <laughs> jeez, Louise, right? We, but you know, we have community. We got family. We got all kinds of people who support us, and we allow them to. I think that's one of the most important things any mom or dad listening to this should take away. Is you know, we are we are born into community. Allow your friends, family, moms, uncles, brothers to support. We're relational human beings. Hell right? yes. Right. Beautiful. Um, Taking supplements. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Human optimization. Yep. That's I biohack. Yeah. I did the one last night. Um, Your favorite ones? I did a, a vitamin IV therapy, uh, which is, you know, uh, goes into the vein. Um, the reason why I do vitamin therapy is because it goes straight into the bloodstream as opposed to <laughs> taking pills. <coughs> if you take pills and supplements, it goes into your uh, intestines and you only get maybe 10% of that thing. Mm. Uh, but if you go straight into the bloodstream, you get 100% of it. So, so I feel it immediately. Oh, yes. Immediately. Um, and it's, it's like, you know, I'm f- basically 40, but th- my energy levels are like an 18-year-old. Right. I'm like wired. I'm on it. Yeah. And so that and um, surfing and drinking a lot of water and having a lot of sex and, yeah. you know, all the... All the How long have you been married for? Uh, married. Or like in your relationship? We've been in a relationship almost seven years. Nice. Yeah. And the relationship still sexually is... Uh, Pumping. But the reason why... I like pumping. (laughs) (laughs) The reason why is because we're we're so different. Uh We're similar and yet there's polarity. Um, I also don't dump all my stuff on her. I don't believe, and some people may Mm -hmm. completely disagree with this, I don't believe especially a man should be dumping all his stuff on his wife or girlfriend. Yes. Uh, What sense? What do you mean? Like you, you, all the stuff you deal with and are oh, stressed yeah. out about, yeah, yeah. like because sure. w- when we fill up She's the feminine, not your therapist. yeah, exactly. When yeah. we fill up the feminine, she'll fill up the masculine, mm-hmm. and doing that over and over again takes away the sexual polarity. So right. there's mystery still. I still, I still don't know her. You know, I'm just, I'm trying to find out who my wife is. You know, so. where do you see yourself in five years? You're moving uh, to Austin, huh, you fucker? Yep. Yeah. Uh, bought a house Don't in Austin. Us, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you already bought it and everything. Why? The environment? Because I hear like it's like a, it's Texas, but it's kind of hippie. And yeah. It's, like, yeah. It's, like, it's like Venice mm, in yeah. Texas um, with, with tech. It's and like bang for mm-hmm. a buck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, five years, I'll own 
10 to 20 properties. Uh, I'll still be doing this work on a very high level, but I won't um, rely on it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Big, beautiful, happy family, stay at home dad, freaking, you know, nice doing the damn thing, man. Well, let's bring it home. But before thanking Preston, I just want to thank you, Erfan, for allowing me to ask more questions and be more into <laughs> of course, someone man. that I've been... It's He's a dream guest, right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And I did it without asking Conscious Boss to do me a favor. Uh, I did it my way. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, I had it. So, uh, but Preston, thank you so much for being here. Thank yeah. you. It, it's definitely a privilege to have you in the house. Thank you yeah, for man. just being the man that you are. Yeah. Um, the example that you set, the role model that you are for all of us, including myself. Yeah, and I hope to see you keep flying high and as high as you can and keep inspiring us. We definitely need it, my brother. Love you. For sure, man. Love it. Hope you, to man. stay connected after the show, too. Hell yeah. Sure. Hell yeah. Peace. Beautiful. Nomad out.